So for this video we're going to look in a little bit more detail at the multi-store model of memory and particularly we're going to look at three features of the model capacity, encoding and duration. So this first word capacity um, you're probably already familiar with, you've probably come across it in um, different situations and it literally just means um, how much, so how much something can contain. So when we're talking about memory we're asking about how much information, particularly short term and long term memory can contain. So for short term memory the key number is 7 plus or minus 2 units or 5 to 9 units of information. Now it's really important when you're writing about the capacity of short-term memory that you do use this term units or you write units of information because um, a unit of information doesn't necessarily have to be one number or one letter. If we look at this example, um, that number 08127882 has nine digits in it. Now the person on the left is looking a bit unhappy. Nine digits is a lot to remember if you think each of those um, are separate units of information. Um, and some people will be able to remember it. It's on the upper edge or the upper capacity of short-term memory, but many people would struggle to remember that much. However, if we do something called chunking, which we've done on the right there, um, so we've put 081127882, um, that only puts it into three chunks of information, which many more people would be able to remember. So this idea of chunking was developed by a psychologist called Miller, and it's used very often in things like telephone numbers, postcodes, car number plates, because it helps us to increase the capacity of our short-term memory. Long-term memory is much more simple. Um, we believe the capacity of long-term memory to be limitless. So you can keep putting information in there and um, it would never be full. Now that doesn't mean that we can necessarily retrieve all of that information from long-term memory. Obviously we've all had experiences where there's something we can't remember, but that doesn't mean that that information isn't in long-term memory, it just means we're having trouble retrieving it from long-term memory. Duration is again another word that you've probably come across in everyday life, and it means how long, so how long information in this case can stay in short-term memory and long-term memory. So for short-term memory, it's about 18 to 30 seconds without maintenance rehearsal. This is very important for long-term memory. Maintenance rehearsal increases the amount of time that we can keep something in short-term memory. But when we're actually measuring duration of short-term memory, we're doing it without maintenance rehearsal. Long-term memory, we believe up to a lifetime. So again, there might be issues with retrieval, but that doesn't mean that information has necessarily been lost from long-term memory. The hardest concept is probably encoding, or coding, as you'll sometimes see it written down. And this is about changing the form of the information into a format that our memories can process. So if you think of our memories as being similar to a computer, when we enter data into a computer, the computer changes it into a format that it can recognise. So code that means something to the computer and then it knows how to process it. Our memories have to do a similar thing. So short-term memory and long-term memory tend to code information in different ways. There are three different forms of coding that our memories use, acoustic, visual and semantic. Acoustic is auditory, so encoding information through um, the way that we hear things. Visual is encoding something visually, so through seeing. Semantic is about encoding something through meaning. Now the chief form of coding in short-term memory is acoustic and the chief form of encoding in long-term memory is semantic. Now I'm going to take you through a couple of studies which we're going to look at in more detail in class but it's good to have this idea just as a couple of them are a little bit more complicated and this will help you to really understand what we're doing in the lesson. So the first one was about testing the duration of short-term memory and this was carried out by Peterson and Peterson. So what Peterson and Peterson did was they presented their participants with nonsense trigrams. Now a nonsense trigram is three letters um, put together that mean nothing. So for example, BBC would be a trigram because it's three letters, but it's not a nonsense trigram because BBC to us has a meaning. So these were all trigrams that had no meaning. 
Once they presented these uh, or each trigram individually, they would then ask the participant to carry out some sort of mathematical distractor task. For example, count backwards in threes from 187. They would have to do that for a period of time and after that given time period they would need to repeat the trigram back with the three letters in the correct order. So for example if the initial trigram was QOE they would then have to do the mathematical distractor task and then after that time period repeat QOE back. So three things for you to think about with this study. Number one, what was the point of that mathematical task? So why did Peterson and Peterson ask their participants to do this? Number two, what might have been the suitable time periods that Peterson and Peterson could have used before they asked the participants to repeat the trigram back? And three, what results would you expect to find knowing what you know about the duration of short-term memory? The second study I'm going to tell you about is one that was carried out by Badley who has done an awful lot of research into memory and this was a study into encoding and he was looking at encoding in both short-term and long-term memory. Now he divided his participants into four different groups and he presented them with a list of words which were either semantically similar words which are things like big, large and huge, things that mean similar things, or semantically dissimilar, or acoustically similar words, so words that sound similar, are uh, acoustically dissimilar words, so words that sound different. Then each group was split into two again, and they either had to recall that list immediately or after a delay. And they could recall those words in any order they liked, um, but they had to get as many as possible. So each group was split into two and asked to do that. So again, a couple of questions to get you thinking about this. Badly found that one of the groups confused the semantically similar words and one of the groups confused the acoustically similar words. So the first question is which group would confuse the semantically similar words and which would, acu which would confuse the acoustically sim similar words? And the second question is why would that happen? So you can have a look in the pre-reading if you want a bit more information about capacity, encoding and duration. And make sure that when you come to the lesson, you can define each of those key terms correctly with respect to memory. Make sure you can state what the capacity, duration and primary encoding types are for short term and long term memory. Suggest the answers for the three questions about the Peterson and Peterson duration study and suggest the answers for the two questions about Badley's encoding study.